Hi, I'm John Malos. Welcome to this live edition of Connect With Me on the showroom floor at Ventura TV on this Tuesday. Glad you're here because this Tuesday morning we're talking about a national crisis. You may want to call in 436-ME-TV, option 11. Connect With Me starts right now. Glad you're back here on the program on a Tuesday morning. And, of course, we're here on the showroom floor at Ventura TV, as we are Monday through Friday, live at 10 o'clock in the morning. There are your stations right there, all three of them. You believe that we broadcast live on three stations? Comcast Channel 375, number one, 13.1 uh, and 43.6 over-the-air broadcast if you don't have cable or any of those other uh, networks. Anyway, the replay comes up at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 13.6 YouTube, 8 o'clock tonight, 4.6 Biz TV. As a matter of fact, you can go to our webpage, Ventura Broadcasting. Uh, just Google Ventura Broadcasting. It'll take you to that Connect With Me webpage. Uh, it'll throw you right into it, and you can watch all of our shows dating back to 2008. 12. That's if you uh, don't have television, you want to watch us on the internet. Anyway, uh, tomorrow's show, I want to get into that just a little bit for like a minute here or so. I want to talk about the Fresno Teachers Association. We'll have some of those teachers in the house uh, tomorrow morning. You're asking, well, why aren't they going to be in the classroom? Well, some are going to be here. You know why? Because for the first time in I don't know how many years, umpteen years, let's put it that way, there could be, could be a strike. And for the first time, they're going to have uh, they're going to be here for a television interview talking about the possibility of a strike at Fresno Unified. Very interesting program. I wanted to promote that to make sure that you watch tomorrow because the head of the teachers union is going to be in the house with uh, some other folks. Anyway, on to our topic of the day. And you know, my friends, I don't want to sit here and be an alarmist, but on this day, on this topic, I guess to a certain extent, we all have to be an alarmist. I'm talking about the opioid overdose and addiction problem here in this country, not only in Fresno, not only in the state of California, but all across the land. In fact, President Trump has called it a national crisis. He wants to put a team together to try to fight uh, this drug abuse, this drug addiction that has taken hold, a grip of this nation since the late 90s, from what I understand. And when you have a guy like John Mallows, me, the host of this program, knowing all of a sudden how to spell the word fentanyl, you know that there is a problem. I've never been a drug user, never abused drugs or anything like that, so I can honestly say that doing a lot of the research, I find it very shocking. This national crisis has, has reached uh, proportions that are just unimaginable. I mean, in Ohio, in Maine, in Pennsylvania, up in Northern California. I don't know if you read the article in the Fresno Bee about a week ago Sunday talking about some of the major problems up near Sacramento. More than 90 Americans die after overdosing on opioids each and every day. 90 each and every day. And I'll tell you what, where are they coming from? They're coming from overseas. In fact, recently Fox News did a special report on a drug bust on opioids coming in on the boats in the ports of New York. Where do they come from? China. Check out this report. The opioid academ uh, epidemic putting a spotlight on efforts to intercept illegal drugs being shipped into the country. Laura Engel takes us behind the scenes at one of the main points of entry, a massive warehouse at New York's Kennedy Airport. Good morning, Laura. Good morning, Shannon. And JFK's International Mail Facility really acts as one of our nation's borders. It's where a million packages arrive and are processed each and every day and has been one way that opioids have been getting smuggled into our country. Using drug-sniffing dogs, x-rays, and handheld laser detectors, U.S. Customs and Border Protection officers are working the front lines at JFK's International Mail Facility, where 60% of the nation's mail arrives to stop illegal drugs from entering the country. 
Richard Baum, acting White House drug czar, says the focus is on opioids. The number one drug that's killing Americans is fentanyl, and fentanyl is coming through the mail in very in lots of small packages. The latest figures show more than 33,000 people died from drug overdoses in the U.S. involving opioids in 2015. CBP agents at JFK find drugs hidden in a variety of ways every day. We just found a package that uh, contains GBL, which is a date rape drug, and you can tell from the package that uh, they, they, they include some things like sponges to make us think that it is actual uh, car, uh, turtle wax car washing equipment. Fentanyl also arrives in concealed packages coming primarily from Hong Kong and China. Screening is a challenge, but now with updated technology, the fight to stop fentanyl and other opioids from coming into the U.S. is improving. We can't stand still. Uh, the sorting problem is so huge that we need better quality data earlier. The message uh, is clearly that uh, we are working with all of our partners to combat this threat and that uh, we will find you. We will eventually get to you and uh, bring you to justice. And Shannon, one of the biggest legal hurdles has been the lack of tracking information from international senders. And it is something that the CBP continues to work with their international peers to try and catch these guys, stop them, and prosecute them. Back to you. All right, Laura Engel, thank you very much. Live in our studio right now to talk about this national crisis is the founder of PAIN, P-A-I-N, Parents and Addicts in Need, is Flint Anderson. Flint, uh, i got to ask you before we go to break here, national crisis um, and I know a little bit about your background. You can explain it throughout the entire program. We have a whole hour to discuss, uh, you know, your background and, and what's going on around the nation. But, and I, I know you a little bit now because you've been coming on this program for so long. Right. I mean, we don't get together for drinks or anything, but. Right. Especially but, since I don't drink. <laughs> since, yeah, since I don't drink either. But right. we don't, we, you know, right. I, but I know you well enough to know that you're, you are serious when it comes to this issue. Is there a silver lining at the end of the tunnel? No, not, no, not 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 anywhere in the near future, John. Uh, yeah. This is when when we talk about this being a crisis and a national emergency. That's exactly what it is. And we can talk all day long about how we're going to stop these drug dealers from bringing in these drugs. But the real issue is how do we get the message across to Americans? How do we get the message across to doctors and to lawmakers? Um, uh, uh, not only about the problem, but how do we get the message across to people about taking this drug and understanding what these drugs do to the human body? Right. We're going to talk about that during the course of the program. Flint Anderson is here. He's the founder of Pain. He's a return guest. He's been here many times before uh, for the last four or five years talking about this major problem, which has evolved. It's gotten, in fact, since your first appearance here, it's gotten worse. It's got, yeah, absolutely. Has it's, it not? You bet. You bet it has. No, no doubt about it. All right. Call in four three. Six Me TV Option Eleven will be here for the full hour. Connect with me on Me TV. Fresno is back in just a moment. And away we go. Here's the place that makes you smile. Stick around and stay a while. We're the home of great TV. That's memorable. That's, That's me. Follow me, sir. Call them classics. Call them the best. Call them favorites. We are guests. Every day there's more to come. Watch and see. There's only one. Me TV. All you have to do is watch me. Are you kidding me? Follow me. That's memorable. That's me. That's me. Me, me, me. Uh, me TV. When you like Ventura TV Appliance on Facebook, it's nice. But when you love the Whirlpool appliances we deliver, it's even better. Our website is cool, and it's a good place to start. But you really should touch the merchandise before you buy. Touch the new Whirlpool Ice Collection. It offers a modern style made to create an inspiring kitchen experience. Save big on this Whirlpool Black Ice or White Ice Kitchen. Come in to Ventura TV Appliance and touch the merchandise today. All right, back here on the program with Flint Anderson, a very serious topic today, and I encourage you to call in at 436-MEET-TV, option 11, because if you have a relative, you know, a son, a daughter, a niece, a nephew, yeah, grandchildren, um, your wife, your husband, whoever, uh, that has a drug problem, uh, that's in pain, all of a sudden they're using painkillers, and that's how it starts, right, Flint, with painkillers, and then all of a sudden it's off to the races? Yes, that's that's in essence that's what happens because again people don't understand the addictive qualities of these drugs and after you take you know whether it's a Vicodin or a Norco a drug like that you can actually become dependent on that drug within about two weeks and and 
so again, as as doctors prescribe more and more of these narcotics, people feel that they have to take the entire bottle, right? Um, so now you're three weeks into it or four weeks into it, and it's and it's extremely difficult to stop. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned Vicodin. I know what that is. The other one you mentioned was Norco. Norco. Now, what is that? Norco is basically the same thing as Vicodin. It's hydrocodone. It's 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 the same. It's the same drug. So um, it's a painkiller. It is a painkiller, and that's the number. I believe that's the number one drug that is prescribed by doctors for pain when it comes to any type of you know, especially surgery. Yeah. And and so um, it starts with painkillers, and then um, all of a sudden you get addicted to these painkillers. Is that how it works? You know, you know the, after surgery, let's say. Yeah, you know, John, there's there's in my opinion there's a difference. There's a difference between uh, dependency and abuse and full-blown drug addiction. And one can become dependent upon this drug. Okay. Um, again, like I said, within about a about a two-week period. Right. All right. But that's but that's dependency. That's right? dependency. Now you get to the abuse side of it, where all of a sudden that 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 one every four hours that the doctor prescribed isn't working for you. Mm -hmm. So now you're taking two. The two's not working every four hours. So now you're taking four, and on you know up and up. So so now that's when the abuse starts to kick in. But then all of a sudden you realize realize, hey, I can't get through the day without taking my painkillers. Now that's when the addiction starts in. And then of course, and not everybody turns into a full-blown drug addict. But the fact of the matter remains is that w when you're addicted to these, now you're going to start to do everything and anything you can to get that drug in your system, whether that's stealing, whether it's lying, whether it's lying to your doctor, saying you have more pain than, than normal. Um, you know, you're, 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 you're finding ways to pay for the medications, your doctor shopping, your, you know, all of this comes into play once, once that drug addict stage hits. Okay, so if that's the <clears throat> case, then, then the question that I have is, uh, I, I, you know, very few people, I'm not saying everyone, but I would say, venture to say that very few people skate through life, if they live long enough, eventually they're going to have an operation. Yes at some point yes. in their life, if they live long enough, right. it's unavoidable, okay, to a certain extent. Uh, may not be everybody across the board, but it's, I'd say, the majority of the population. So should we be scared to have surgery because of the potential that could happen? No, I don't think so. I, I, I think what needs to happen here is that physicians obviously have to be more responsible in their practice, or in their prescribing practices. You know, for example, is and I, and I don't Look, nobody wants to have to get to this point, but I believe we are there where now by law a doctor has to be regulated on what he or she can prescribe. And what I mean by that is the number of pills. If somebody comes in and they've got a sprained ankle, well, first of all, it's a sprained ankle. Why would you prescribe anything other than ibuprofen and, you know, ice, uh, and, ice and, and elevate yeah. your ankle? But if it's a surgery, you know, may, maybe we get to the point where the doctor prescribes 10 pills, all right, to get you through that first 24 or 48 hours of, of, of that surgical pain, but that surgical pain, that is going to go away. It's not, it, there, there's a difference between when you first tore your knee up and then the post-operative pain. And, and so again, I think we really have to look at monitoring physicians and how many they prescribe. Because mm. I see it all day long. Doctors are prescribing 240 10 milligram Norco to someone. They're prescribing. When they shouldn't when be. When they shouldn't be. There's because absolutely no reason for it why? because the potential for addiction is so high. Well, what should, they be, what should the, the prescribed dose be then at that point? Again, I'm not trying to tell physicians what to do, but I'm, but I'm almost at that point. Look, prescribe, prescribe 30, right? Or prescribe okay. 20. For, for, for the surgical post-operative pain, right? And by the way, if, if it's still hurting and if you still think that you need something, you can always call your doctor. But one of the reports I read, and especially with dentists, one of the reasons why they prescribe so many to begin with is, and this is a fact, they don't want to have to talk to the patient again about their narcotic refill. They're so busy. They have so many patients that they don't want to be bothered. This was in a Why? this was in a national report. So they prescribe, however many, 90 pills. So they don't have to even talk about prescribing more pills for that patient for a couple months. 
Wow, I'm glad my dentist is not like that because uh -huh. he's very careful about what he prescribes. Right. Of course, I'm a heart patient, so he has to prescribe something before I go, even go in for any kind of procedure. Right. Um, it's just a preventative type measure. But, um, you know, I, 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 I watch a lot of cable news. Uh, I, I, follow what's, I try to follow what's going on. And yesterday, CNN had this report, very alarming report. In fact, Jake Tapper went out and did the story. In Ohio, okay, foster parents are becoming rare. There's a shortage of foster parents and, and a shortage of foster homes, and you have all the, the influx of all these children now that are being left homeless because their parents are addicted to what? To opiates. opioids. Right. Opiates. I, yeah. Right, right. I read this I read the same article. Unbelievable. Right. And, okay. Ohio, and Ohio, just so you know, Ohio has one of the largest problems in the country with this. Ohio, Kentucky, Virginia, right. uh, few Maine. Of, Maine, few of those states. But the, I just point that out just to give you a trickle down effect right. of it. It goes right down to the family tree. Well, you could even start with the fact that the child is addicted when they're born. I mean, that's that's another massive problem that we have well, I mean being left without a home but being left any place to go if you're four or five years old right right exactly isn't that awful it's 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 absolutely awful and and, and again there's there's I don't know what to do to change that because look we, we we always try to get somebody into treatment but again that's a whole nother fight with me because if 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 traditional treatment is work claims that it's working then why isn't everybody clean and sober yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. So we, ha we, we there, there's so many things that have to be changed in this in order to succeed. But one of them, again, is educating young parents and educating them well on what this what what opiates do to these kids because most of these kids start out using these things in high school it's it's okay, but but we just talked about if you go in and have an operation and you need a painkiller. Uh, like Vicodin, that's how it begins. So, so you, now you're telling me that young kids are starting out on this without even going in to, for surgery. They're just they're just popping these pills. Let me give you an interesting stat. Twenty five. So there, there, there are two 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 different scenarios. Abs here? Absolutely. Here, here's an interesting stat. Twenty five percent of all high school athletes on a study that was done say that they are abusing painkillers. Because? Because of sports injuries. Okay. And not even real, I'm talking about getting, you know, a football player getting dinged, you know, on the field right. and he's, right. he's just got some aches and pains. So that football player starts to take those. Well, then all of a sudden the doctor prescribes him, let's say the doctor prescribes him 30 pills. Those pills are at home. He takes a few of them. All of a sudden he knows that now he can sell those on campus for 15 bucks a pill. Yeah. So now he's selling them to other kids and, and, the, and the cycle just goes goes around and around and around. Yeah, I urge you to go on the internet when you go home. Maybe you've already done it. You, you follow the news like I do, Flint, better than I do probably. But um, there are two stories, di very disturbing stories that I read on the internet just recently here. And I want to talk about those uh, before I go to break. Number one, Jim Plunkett. I know you know who Jim Plunkett is. A lot of you do. He's the former quarterback at Stanford. He won the Heisman Trophy back in the 70s. He won two Super Bowls with the Oakland Raiders. Uh, he should be in the Hall of Fame, one of the greatest quarterbacks ever. Right now, I think he's close to 70 or a little bit over 70 years old. There's a story on the Internet. I believe the San Jose Mercury News did the story because of his football injuries. He had six shoulder operations, several knee operations. Now, at his age, he is on so many drugs. Daily, he's taking like 14, 15 pills a day just to combat the pain. He can barely get out of bed. Right. Is he, is he, is he, is he a drug abuser? Yes. He is? Yes. If somebody's taking 15 pills a day, you're definitely abusing the drugs. In, 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 wow. in, in my opinion. Now, look, there's a, there's a fine line, too, when it comes to certain medical issues. I mean, if somebody has cancer and, and it's life-threatening cancer, I have no problem with somebody taking all the medications they want to. Right. Anything and everything. Yeah. I mean, come on. It's cancer. Right. Right. But again, somebody like Jim Plunkett, all right, at 70 years of age, and I guarantee you, John, if they say he's taking 15 or if he says he's taking 15, Even 10 he's, or 12? he's taking 30 
all right? He's taking more than that because these drugs, you have to increase them. The body builds up a tolerance and that 15 pills a day just isn't going to do it anymore. It's called chasing the high because we yeah. want we want that, that pain to go away, so we're gonna take more and more. Man, and there's another story, and since the San Jose Mercury News uh, talked to Jim Plunkett, they also went and talked to one of his offensive linemen who played alongside him and protected Jim Plunkett all those years in Oakland. Um, he was an offensive tackle. His name was Henry Lawrence. He's in the same boat because of all the injuries he had, taking so many painkillers right. per day. I mean, football is a huge, I mean, it's like gladiators of the old days. Right. Uh, they took tremendous hits and injuries, and so they. I, I guess as you get older, it affects your body, affects your bones, your muscles, your tendons. They got to do something for the pain. I know. Or they can't get out of bed. And this is the battle that we're in. This is the battle that we're in. It's 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 such an enormous problem, and and look, when somebody's in that much pain, I you know, it's you it's. Get it. you I, get I, it. I I get it. I I get it. But the fact of the matter is now Jim Plunkett at seventy, instead of enjoying his grandchildren or whatever it is he wants to do, he's a slave to the drugs. Yeah, it's just it's sad. You almost uh, break out in tears just reading right. that story, knowing what a sports hero. Uh, Jim Plunkett was, uh, uh, not only to many Raider fans, but uh, football fans around the country. And by the way, he should be in the Hall of Fame, as should Tom Flores, the former head coach, by the way, from Sanger over here, Tom Flores. Anyway, 436 Me TV Option 11, uh, Flint Anderson is here. He's with Payne. Uh, we'll come back and talk with more uh, about this, this opioid addiction overdose uh, problem in the country. 436 Me TV Option 11, back in a moment. Frigidaire. We introduce the first home freezer. The first pulsator agitator washer. And now we introduce the Frigidaire Orbit Clean Dishwasher, designed with a unique wash arm that gives you four times more water coverage for a consistently better clean. Frigidaire, over 90 years of legendary innovation. See the full line of Frigidaire appliances at Ventura TV Electronics and Appliances. Giddy up with westerns, we've got the best ones. Superhero sci-fi spin, grab the popcorn and stay in. Dramas, mystery, and action, take a look and see what happens. Carol, Andy, Lucy, Mash, timeless comedies full of laughs. Hey, that's me. That's me. That's me, Chief. Yeah, me, me, me. Me, 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 you gotta see. That's memorable, that's me. Me. Me, TV. A drug called fentanyl is so powerful, if you simply touch it, you can overdose quickly. The opiate was developed to treat extreme pain and is usually prescribed to advanced stage cancer patients. It can be 100 times more powerful than morphine. This photo shows the amount of heroin that can cause an overdose and the amount of fentanyl that can cause the same effect. An illegal version of the synthetic drug has been popping up all over the U.S. and according to the Centers for Disease Control, has been reported the most in Ohio, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. But it's not just a danger to people who use the illegal drug. It's also posing a threat to law enforcement agents trying to get the drug off the streets. This Ohio police officer was collecting evidence from a car when he came into contact with the white powder. He needed four doses of Narcan to be revived. Listen to what it felt like for these two New Jersey police officers when they were overcome by the drug during an evidence collection. I felt like my body was shutting down. Um, and I, the people around me said that I looked really white and lost color. Um, and it, it just really felt like I thought, thought that was it. I thought I was dying. I couldn't breathe. Very disoriented. The Drug Enforcement Administration is warning officers around the country to handle fentanyl with extreme caution. Because whether it's ingested, inhaled, or absorbed through the skin, as little as two milligrams of the drug can be lethal. Fentanyl can kill you. This is Inside Edition In Depth. And I got to tell you, that's a scary report. I, like I said at the top of the program, don't mean to be an alarmist, but in this case, do we have to be? Yes. 
no, no, no question about it. We are, we are, we are at that point in this country where everybody needs to be an alarmist. You know, I, I, I relate this almost back to you know when Germany invaded Poland in 1939, and we saw it. We saw it coming. We knew it was happening. Yet we did nothing about it. And and if we had done something about it, maybe the disasters that, that, that followed wouldn't have happened. We have seen this opioid crisis coming. We have, everybody has been in it, has been a part of it. We have, we have created it and now we don't know what to do with it. And, and, and again, it's something else that should have been avoided. But here it is and going back to what you said, John, yes, everybody needs to be an alarmist at this point. We, we lost three kids right here in Fresno uh, over the summer, you know, due to overdose. Um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's hitting home directly. Yeah. You know, so, so again, the question stands, how do we stop this thing? Okay, caller, uh, you've been patient. Uh, you're waiting to talk to Flynn Anderson. Go ahead, what's your question? Let me, let me ask you a question that, you know, uh, the drugs are going all around, and I think it's a, it's a problem for the doctors prescribing a lot of, like, like Vicodin, especially because Vicodin is a big, big name for uh, uh, a lot of the uh, so-called, I mean, the ones who, who just get it to sell them, okay, and that's a problem. Because sometimes they don't even need it. They can think that their, their, their joints or whatever has a problem. A good doctor will will not prescribe the, the Vicodin or so and get something less because that, that's where the doctors come uh, should be aware of what's going on. And now a lot of the doctors are just pulling away from treating patients that need that Vicodin just, you know, just because. Uh, the liability cause number one. I, I know quite a few boys that at 14, as young as 14, taking Vicodins and, and the heart pills uh, and going out and selling them. And where did he get them? Not, not only in, in the, in the R, uh, R, uh, 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 the hospitals, whatever, but they go to the parents, uh, grandparents' uh, cabinets, and they start taking one pill, this pill, and that pill. And that, that's the problem. We have to educate the kids at that age. Don't wait till 18, 19. It's too late. They have to get them at 13, 14. And, and I understand where you're coming from. You're going to lose a lot of these young kids because they're not aware how strong the pills are. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, I, yeah, I agree, John. I mean, for, first of all, it's not only about educating the kids, though. It's, it's, it's more so in educating the parents and for the parents to be on, on top of this thing. You know, he, ma he made an interesting point. Um, <clears throat> and, 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 and the fact is, the United States alone uses 99% of the world's Vicodin supply. Hmm. That is a national... Say that again. The United States uses 99% of the world's Vicodin supply. That is a, a verifiable statistic. We, we, and we use 80% of all opioids in the world today, the United States. So, so then I start to think, well, are we in more pain than any other country? You know, what, what is the reason behind it? Why are we using that many pills as opposed to other countries that, that, that aren't? What should the government be doing? Again, I really think it has to start with changing prescribing practices you with said that physicians. Earlier. And in fact, you yes. said that a couple of times now, but is that the lone uh, really a uh, problem solver? No, no. I, what I, else should be done? Look, I think there has to be more education in the in the schools, and I'm not talking okay. about Red Ribbon Week. You know, there, again, there's not a study or statistic out there that tells you that Red Ribbon Week is effective. In fact, it, it tells you just the opposite. Really? Yes. We, we spend millions upon millions of dollars a year across this country on Red Ribbon Week for kids to get out of school, basically, and these kids could care less. This is... We we need more hard-hitting education for, t for teachers, for, for students, and by the way, to require parents to come in and hear this. I know that's a difficult task and because, because we don't want to add another brick onto teachers' schedules because they've got, already got so much to do. 
but we are losing kids. We're losing them at Bullard High School, Clovis West, Buchanan, Clovis North. We are losing them all over the place, and it's time that people step up, admit that there's a problem, and let us come in and try to handle this. Are those schools that you mentioned, do they have the biggest problem? You mentioned Bullard, you mentioned Buchanan, you mentioned, I forgot who else. Clovis uh, West. Clovis West. Clovis Are North. Are they the biggest abusers? Fresno Christian, yes. Really? When it comes to prescription pills and, and, and then the heroin use. Look, in, with our organization, we, we ask every family that walks through our door where your kid went to school. Uh, and 98% of our clientele went to those schools that I just mentioned, and we've seen over a thousand families in the last five years. Flint, I got to go to break, but um, I have a child who goes to Bullard. What should I tell her? <laughs> first of all, as, advice? As, as a parent, first thing I'd be doing is I'd be drug testing her on a, on a, on a regular basis. Because look, look, not all kids are going to turn to drugs. That's that's a fact. I should be drug testing my Absolutely. own child. Absolutely, I, I have. Even though I know she's a good kid. They're all I good know. kids, John. They're okay. all good kids. All right. The kids that died this last summer, they were all good kids. They were all athletes. They all had good grades. They all did those things. And how do you drug test? I mean, how do you do it without because what if I invading my, their privacy? Yes. W why would you care? There are they, are they underage and living in your home? If you get resistance from a child, say, no, you're not going to drug test me, what do, does a parent do? Well, then you have your, basically you have your answer, okay? Why wouldn't they want to drug test, right? If, if, if they have nothing to hide, right, right? Why, wouldn't a, why wouldn't a young person go, okay, yeah, dad, I'll, I'll pee in the cup for you, right? Because, look, this, is, this, isn't, this isn't about being their friend. This is about saving their life first and worrying about them liking you later because they're always going to love you. That's a fact. This is about saving lives. John, I see it every single day, the amount of kids that we're losing, the kids that walk through our doors that are so incredibly engulfed in the drug culture now that it's, that it's, it's frightening. You don't want to wind up in a spot where a lot of our parents are. Even though my child, and, and I, I think like all parents, like you right. too, would be, would be the last one to use drugs, right. still drug test? Absolutely. Ab ab absolutely. I would. I would. At get what age do you start <clears throat> doing that? Look, we've got. We've had kids as, as as young as 12 and 13 start, especially with the opioids. Okay. You know, and and here's why they're using these drugs. It's not like smoke, even smoking pot or drinking alcohol. It's not you, about that, is you, it? No, no. You can't smell it, right? right. You you can't smell a pill. So so. Right. And by the way, usually I tell parents, are, is your child in a good mood? And, and they say, well, yeah, and I say, that's one of the first signs, because most kids aren't in a good mood. They're, yeah. they're usually irritated about something. But opiates make you feel good. But when should my radar go up? It should just, parent? as a parent, it should go up the, the, the minute be they up turn 24 third. hours a day? Absolutely, especially when it comes to this. Okay, 436, MeTV Option 11. We ran that video about what fentanyl is. When we come back, we'll get uh, Flint's uh, take on it. He's here. Uh, don't be afraid to call in uh, if you have a problem. I, I mean, Flint's here to help. I mean, we'll even get out his phone number if you want to call him. Go to his website. Uh, could be an email address that you could use. 436 Me TV Option 11. Is this a national crisis? What do you think? Call in back in a moment. When you're looking for Whirlpool innovation and quality, who has the answers, the selection, the price? Ventura TV Appliance. With billions in nationwide appliance buying power, more than Home Depot and Best Buy combined will help you save. Our low prices on Energy Star qualified Whirlpool appliances save you energy and money and pay no interest on select models when paid in full within 12 months. Ventura TV Appliance, serving you since 1951. Unscramble. Sing, honey, sing. <laughs> Back here on the program, talking serious uh, talk here. So fentanyl. You know, it, it, look, I never drank alcohol, never really was a drug of it, but when I can spell fent, the word fentanyl, 
Isn't that, <laughs> that's yeah. a little bit alarming. That's a little bit alarming. <laughs> that's a little yeah. bit alarming. So I saw the video, we all saw the video. What is fentanyl and why is it so lethal? I mean, you can touch it and, and you are you could die? Yeah, fent fentanyl basically is a drug that you get in the hospital. Like the piece said, you know, it's given for cancer. It's 100 times stronger than morphine. Um, but oh now what, what drug dealers are doing is they, you know, it's a synthetic drug, so it's man-made. Okay. So uh, China and Russia, who are basically shipping this stuff over to our shores. Why are we letting them do it? Well, they're not. They're, 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 they're sneaking it in. Is, is what they're doing. And then okay. what drug dealers do is because it's odorless and tasteless, uh, they will lace different drugs with it. They, they will actually put it on Norco. They'll put it on, an, on another painkiller. And they'll, they'll, combine the they'll, two? they'll combine the two. And again, these drug dealers don't have an idea of how much or how little they're putting on. And yeah, yes, there have been six people that died in Sacramento. I think there was 24 people in Chicago, 50, over 50 people in Ohio. Um, that that you you ingest this fentanyl that, that, that killed them that was fent the fent the combination of the fentanyl and the and the norco is is but but again it's the fentanyl but there's also a drug out there called carfentanil which which people aren't talking a whole lot about now and that is an elephant tranquilizer and that'll put down a three-ton elephant that is all and that by the way is i believe is again maybe maybe a thousand times stronger than the fentanyl so so when you in ingest that you're you're dead before you even hit the ground okay may, 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 maybe part <clears throat> of the problem is why we have such an epidemic here and a national crisis is a lot of people don't understand these drugs like you do. Right. I mean, they, I don't understand these drugs like you do. I can't even bear. I can barely pronounce them. Right. And and people isn't that part of the problem? That is because people do not understand the addictive qualities of these drugs. The simplest way I can put this is: if you go home and have a glass of wine tonight, okay. that alcohol content is going to start to leave your body almost immediately. You're going to via perspiration, urination. It's going to come out. Out. These drugs don't even start to leave your body for on, 24 Carl. hours. Really? Right. So they stay in a lot longer. They stay in a lot longer. It's called a half-life. So if you drink a beer, glass of wine, it's gone within a couple of hours. Yeah. Okay. But this stuff stays in for that means wow. only half of the pill is leaving your body in 24 hours. Wow. Okay. Caller, you're on the air. Go ahead with Flynn Anderson. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, I've been aware of the problem of drugs for over 50 years now. And I think the problem is to just do away with the uh, Controlled Substance Act, make things legal, let people figure out for themselves what they uh, want to do. Yes, really? some people are going to die. It's just some people are going to die in automobile accidents because they won't drive carefully. Uh, there's always going to be death. As to the problem of children, the man is right. You have to watch your children. You have to drug test them. Uh, and as to the illegal substances coming in from China, uh, you're right there. There's you don't know what you're getting. Legalizing it would at least make sure it's of pure quality and of measured doses. That I think would save lives in itself. All right, hang on, caller. Uh, I've said my piece, don't, don't so I think I'll, I'll go. On. Caller, don't hang up. Stay. Did the caller right, hang up? Right. Hang on, hang on, caller. Flint, you want to respond to that? You want to legalize all drugs and that'll take care of the problem? Yeah, no, I'm going to have to disagree go with ahead. the gentleman on 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 on, on that one. Um, you know, I don't care what drug it is. Um, legalizing it, in in my opinion, just creates a bigger a, a bigger problem. You're, you're you're talking about, and I'm going to use the term, and I'm not particularly fond of it, but drug addicts. All right. I mean, I'm a recovering drug addict, and and that doesn't make me bad or evil or any of those things. Right. But what it does make me is is in in my using days, I was manipulative. I was I I, I was all of the things that that everybody imagines a drug addict were you is. A thief? You know, were you um, I was, a liar? Were you, yeah, yeah, really? yeah. All yeah the, I was. All I of was those negative things that go through my head. You were all of the right. Above? I was all of the above. Oh my god! And was it the drugs that was, that were doing it? It's not the drugs that were. Do yes, it was. It was in order to get the drug that I needed, so I so I wouldn't start going through withdrawal symptoms. Yeah. You know, it's like this congresswoman in San Francisco that wants to start basically legal shooting galleries where people can come in from eight to five to snort, smoke inject uh, ingest any drug that they want to whether it's legal or or, or not and and my question to her was because I wrote her I, I I said I said what you think they're just going to come in and use from eight to five 
you know, what, what do you think we're doing the rest of the, of, of the day and night? You know, it's, it's just creating more and more havoc. We don't have even room to put people What's the anymore. status of that, uh, by the way? Is that, is that gone through? I have no idea. Uh, as, as, again, I don't think it's gone through. Um, I'm going to wow. oppose that one big time. Um, you know, but the fact of the matter is to, to, to legalize it, you're, you're, you're talking about now giving drug addicts more freedom to do what they want, and it's just not wise. Uh, okay, caller, I'm going to get to you in a moment here. I'll let you respond. Just hang on here. I need to ask you, uh, they legalized uh, marijuana in California. It, it takes effect in January. Are you for or against that? Against it. And, okay. and, and one of the reasons is, is this. By the way, you know, parents ask me all the time, can marijuana kill you? And I used to say no. Well, now I say yes because drug dealers are actually taking fentanyl and car fentanyl and lacing marijuana with it. So, so, so yeah, it, it can kill you. It's, wow. it's, it's, I just don't understand why, why we have to legalize any drug. What, what's, what's the matter with being clean and sober? All right, so you, I would assume that uh, the city of Fresno, I know you follow this, the city of Fresno said no to marijuana uh, dispensaries here, right. uh, commercial dispensaries here right. in the city of Fresno. There are other cities that have said yes uh, here in California. Uh, what's your stance on that? I, you know, again, I, I'm all for Fresno saying no. Um, okay. Look, I think most cities do it because they're going to be able to tax it because there's good because it's, it's it's all comes down to money. Mm -hmm. I, it all comes down to money. Go caller. Okay, you're you're back on the air, caller. What what? What's okay, saying? thank you. Well, of course, the gentleman is going to disagree with me because it's in his best interest to disagree with me. I want to state that I am a uh, ex drug addict. I went through it. Uh, I came out and I cleaned myself up. Yes, it would be nice if there were no drugs in uh, uh, America at all, if we were all drug-free, and I include alcohol and tobacco in that. Uh, I stated before that we could do something like uh, putting ankle bracelets on everybody, which would admit an electrical shock if you have any uh, illegal substances in you. Uh, everybody seems to discount that. But we're not going to get a drug-free society because everybody is... Uh, we've had this problem, well, the drug problem goes back to over 100 years, actually, and we're never going to de defeat it. Uh, there's an old saying that uh, persistence uh, breeds resistance, and I think what we have to do is just uh, give in to it, uh, control it the best way we can with legalizing it, and I think that will save lives, and in the end, it'll alleviate the problem. We'll never get rid of the problem completely, and I've said all I have to say. Gentlemen, good morning to both of you, and thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. You know, there, there, there's one thing he said that I do agree with. We, we, we are not going to get rid of the drug problem. There's always going to be somebody using drugs for what, whatever reason. In, in my line of work, John, now it's about saving one person at a time. Because I've learned over the years I, I, I am not going to be able to save everyone. Yeah. It's just um, not going to happen. I want to mention, overall, drugs killed 154,000 people last year. That, according to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, that's where I got most of my research from, which is a part of the National Institute on Health across this country. Uh, President Donald Trump has uh, promised to put together a panel uh, to fight the opioid uh, addiction problem, the national crisis, as he called it. And here's what he said has to happen, his way of prevention. I don't know if you agree with this. He said, and I'm quoting the president now, it's to prevent people from abusing drugs in the first place. How in God's name are we going to do that? Again, we're not going to be able to prevent somebody from doing something that they're going to want to do. But there is a part of this educationally that we need to get out and we need to start it now. We need to start it hard hitting and there needs to be a lot of it. Look. I know several speakers, and I'm one of them, all right, that travel around the country and talk about this. You're on like a national circuit, are you not? You, well, not national. I mean, I do go nationally, but, but, but I, I, I'm not belong to any one group. This is via our organization. Pain. Yes. Okay. But the fact of the matter is, is most people, whether it's a school district, whether it's uh, a, a, a businesses, whatever the case may be, they bring somebody in to speak and they tell their story and it's hard hitting and everybody goes ooh and ah. Like your right? story is very like hard hitting. My story is very hard hitting. 
the difference between, and again, I'm not trying to just blow my own horn here, but right. the difference between us and somebody else that just that they bring in and pay $25,000 to bring them in to, to talk to the community, they tell their story, and what do they do next? They leave. With their money. With their money, and they're not leaving that community with any kind of backup, without any kind of resources, without without a plan on how to continue forward. Okay, I can't go any further, and I don't want to go to break just yet. I will in a minute here. Um, but PAIN stands for Parents and Addicts in Need. Your organization has been in um, in business for how long? It's a nonprofit. Right. What do you do to help these drug abusers, those who are addicted, those who are abusing drugs, and those who nearly died? We've been around since 2009. And we have again. We've seen well over 1,200 families, you know, since since we've been uh, since we've been in business. We do several things. We provide uh, inpatient and outpatient referral services. I'm very picky on where I send somebody mm -hmm. because I think that 95% of treatment centers out there today aren't worth their weight in gold. They're just they're just not worth it. So I'm very picky. I believe in long-term treatment for somebody. You don't change years of addiction and addiction behavior in a 30-day program. You, you just don't do it. Drug addiction is as much behavioral and habitual as it is a physical or psychological addiction. So we, we, we send people to treatment. We provide services for families, which is so important. We have support groups for families and family members on Wednesday nights. Not only do we have one of the largest in the country, we have one of the best. What happens on Wednesday nights? Wednesday nights, look, most support groups, everybody sits around in a circle and one person talks and the next person and then the next person and they don't allow cross-talking and anything like that. Mm. We do. We go in there, we allow it all. And we have given so much because the parent is actually hearing it from somebody in recovery what your child is capable of, what they're not capable of. I tell parents all the time, you know your child better than I do, but I know the drug addict better than you. So here's, here's what you can expect. Here's what you cannot expect. Here's how drug use affects the brain. Here's how it affects them physically. We give them all the information and tell parents that it's usually about a two-year process. By the way, those meetings are free. All right. So Wednesday nights Wednesday where? nights at the St. John Newman Center right across from Bulldog Stadium. Wednesday okay. night, 6.30 to 8.30. We, the, 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 this is probably the most fantastic group of people I've ever been associated anybody with. Anybody can go. Anybody can go. Okay. Any, any, any Wednesday night. So we provide those, those services for families. We provide, we speak to businesses. We speak to universities and high schools. We, we provide it all. Your phone number? Uh, my, my, I actually give my cell out. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the guys. That, you're so free it's, to do what you want. Five five nine nine seven eight nine two three nine. Or Say our, that again. Five five nine nine seven eight nine two three nine. Or our office. Hang on, caller. 559-579-1551. We answer our phones. Yeah, you, and call, you have a great assistant. What's her name, by uh, the way? Jamie Brown Jamie is, Brown, is, is our right, executive yeah. director, her, and Randy yeah. Keller, who's now an administrative yeah. assistant. We have, and we have a therapist, Dana Oleska, that's, that's, that's in the office as well. And we refer out to other outside counselors and therapists and psychologists. Outstanding people over there. Okay, uh, caller, uh, go ahead. You're on the air with Flynn Anderson. <laughs> So the television set is up too loud. He doesn't know that he's on the air. Hello, caller. Can you hear me? I guess not. We'll have to take a break. We'll hang up on that caller. Call back. Turn down the sound. Mute. You ever heard the, about the mute button? They have a mute button now. Just mute that baby and then call us back at 436-MeTV Option 11. Back with Flynn Anderson in just a moment. When you like Ventura TV Appliance on Facebook, it's nice. But when you love the KitchenAid appliances we deliver, it's even better. Our website is cool, and it's a good place to start. But you really should touch the merchandise before you buy. Save big with KitchenAid. Right now, get up to a $1,000 prepaid MasterCard when you purchase select KitchenAid appliances. Get the best selection, price, and service in town without waiting. Come in to Ventura TV Appliance and touch the merchandise today. 
like Ventura TV Appliance on Facebook. It's nice. But when you love the KitchenAid appliances we deliver, it's even better. Our website is cool, and it's a good place to start. But you really should touch the merchandise before you buy. Save big with KitchenAid. Right now, get up to a $1,000 prepaid MasterCard when you purchase select KitchenAid appliances. Get the best selection, price, and service in town without waiting. Come in to Ventura TV Appliance and touch the merchandise today. Actually, Carrie, our director, brought up a very good point. You know, once your kid turns 18, um, you can't tell them what to do. You can't tell them pee in a cup. They're going to tell you, you pee in a cup. Well, why not? You know, it's like they're we're not going to do it. They're like legal adults at the age then, of 18. Then, they can then, do what they want. Then say, guess what? You want to do what you want? This is my house. This is my rules. You either pee in the cup or you don't live here. This is this is very simple. This that we don't have to make this any more difficult than what it is. You know, look, do I believe in the the, the term tough love? Yes, I do. Yeah. Be, be, because I don't want somebody going through what I went through for 23 years. Yeah, I know. I know you went through some tough times and you uh, bet. I know you're an expert and uh, you know I appreciate you being here but appreciate it. doggone it Flint can you give us a, any kind of a silver lining before you leave because I don't want to go home and not sleep tonight worrying about my kids using drugs. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes I can. Okay. okay. You know I'm not going to sleep tonight. I I, I I know that. I I do I I got a 16 year old and a 14 year old. I know and I and here. I've been there and I wouldn't be in your shoes for anything right now. Um no look, Look, you, you know, most families are going to face this problem at, at, at some point. Yeah. Um, but look, we have found that when when the entire family is on the same page with this, all yeah. right, mom and dad and, and aunts and uncles and everybody else, it has a tendency to work. Okay. We have helped quite a few people in this. We've, we've got young people now that have had four years sobriety, three years, five years, and to look at these kids, and, and they're, they're good, productive citizens now. They're married, they have children of their own, you know, but people have to understand, John, there is no cure for this. They're simply, once, once you go through the recovery process, you are not cured. I am not cured. I don't know what tomorrow holds. All I know is I didn't use today. I didn't use yesterday. Tomorrow's another story. I doubt it. Very, very, no, very, no, very, very seriously. Don't. <laughs> but, 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 that yet yeah, there, there is hope. We are doing yeah. good things, and yeah. and we just hope we can continue with it. Yeah, it's it's just about you know living life day to day and don't go back. Don't fall back into that trap if you're you've been a drug user, right? It's like an alcoholic, right? Don't, go backwards but but again and that's a difficult it's thing. difficult I mean, we can i can sit here and say it because i've never you know been in that situation so it's easy for me to sit here and talk but if you've been in that situation and you say don't go back and you've been there it's not so easy to execute that it's not the first two to four years of some, of, of one's recovery those are the toughest years yeah right they're just tough the the brain we have to teach the brain how almost how to rethink how to deal with wow. triggers how to deal with all those little things you know it's like a young person who is hooked on oxycontin let's say and they've been off of it for about a year and they decide to walk into the elbow room one night and have a drink just because they want to feel normal normal. They're not even an alcoholic. All of a sudden they sit down at the table and, and a friend walks up and, 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 and they've had a couple of drinks. So now they're under the influence and the person pulls out an 80 milligram Oxycontin pill and says, Hey, do you want to share this? Right? That's a blindsided trigger. How does a young person deal with that? Yeah. All right. Uh, caller, you've been very patient. I know you have your TV on mute. Go ahead. Flint can hear you just fine. Yeah. I have some yeah, my hats are off to your host there. Uh, you. I am an ex uh, heroin addict, and I've been down that road for many years also, just like your host there. And uh, I didn't want to listen to anybody to tell me what, what to do. And um, Yeah. Okay. Anything else, sir? Thank you. Very much for the call. Very little time left. I want to get into some numbers here and then ask you a couple of questions here. You may have to help me pronounce a couple of these sure. names here. Emergency room visits, again, this is National Institute on Drug Abuse, related to opioid use, have quadrupled yes. in the last 15 years. That according to the National Institute on Drug Abuse. In 2000, emergency room visits uh, regarding opioid use, uh, uh, those who died, 4,400. 2015, 
Those who died in the emergency rooms, 19,000 plus. Right. Are you kidding me? Right. The legitimate that statistic. Is a shocking yes. number. Yes. That is shocking. Okay, how this all started, again, according to this organization, in the late 1990s, pharmaceutical companies reassured the medical community that patients would not become addicted to prescription opioid painkillers, and healthcare providers began to prescribe them at greater rates. That led to widespread diversion and misuse of these medications is that true that is absolutely 100 percent true when did the uh, when did it all happen in the in the, in the early to mid 90s yes prior to prior to 1990 doctors were very skeptical on 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 prescribing large amounts of opiates to treat pain and purdue pharma Purdue Pharmaceutical Company, they came in, they're the ones that developed OxyContin. They came in with a major marketing plan and basically hit the, hit the ground running to every physician and stated, we have a new developed opioid pain pill here and less than 1% of your patients are going to become addicted to this drug. They out and out lied to the medical community. And, Why? And, and well... It's it, Purdue is owned by the Sackler family. Uh, it is is independently owned, family operated. And it's been around for a hundred years. They developed this pill. They marketed it. They own the rights to it. They manufacture it. So they had and it's all about money. And now today, and again, John, I'm not about influence. somebody making money. Okay, I mean, I like money, but the, now they're worth 14 billion dollars off of OxyContin and everybody's misery. Hang on, call. I got very little time. Help me pronounce these. Okay, methadone. What's the other one? Uh, buprenorphine. Okay, buprenorphine. Uh, naltrexone. These three drugs help combat the addiction. And if so, how? Well, that's a whole nother two-hour show, John. Can you be, do it in be, 30 seconds? Methadone, first of all, I think every methadone, <laughs> excuse me, methadone clinic needs to be blown up, all right? It is, it is, okay. it is simply replacing one drug for another. All right. Buprenorphine actually is an outstanding drug to do medical detox with. It's opiate-based, though, and it has an opiate blocker in it. Okay. So, again, we, do, we have to be a, a careful of not trading out one drug for another because right. it is opiate-based. Right. If it's used in a short amount of time, it's perfect. How about naltrexone? Naltrexone is the opiate blocker. That and, and, and Narcan are drugs that are used to prevent overdose but again, or to bring somebody on that you, no you can't really uh, no they no, call no. this an opioid antagonist yeah the you mean the naltrexone yes yes that 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 is going to reverse the effects it's going to block the effects of the opioid okay. is what that's going does to it, do does it work naltrexone sure it, it 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 works but again it's a band-aid until you teach somebody how to live without having to use something that's the key all right quickly caller you've got 30 seconds uh maybe less 15 seconds i'll give you 10 Go. Hurry. Caller? Hello? Caller, hurry, go. <laughs> yes, I wanted to say my input. Uh, you need to get rid of this drugs by getting rid of the uh, the uh, drug dealers and uh, offering a cash award to turn them in. Okay, good deal. Thank you for your input. Will that work? Get rid of the drug dealers. Well, <laughs> depends how you do it. All right, if, if your kids, and I think I got about a minute and a half to two minutes left, um, if your kids reach the age of 18 and they've been clean, no alcohol, no drugs, as a parent, are you in the clear? No. Why? No. Simply because by the time they get to college, here's something interesting for you. Adderall is the number one drug of choice on college campuses Never today. Heard of it. Adderall is used for ADHD, ADD. Um, it is basically its speed. It is cocaine oh, with wow. a C rating. It's the number one drug of choice on college campuses today. Uh, it is a it is a major issue on 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 these campuses, and the fact of the matter is is a lot. Of, by the way, parents think it's okay to use that as a study guide, and and so, yeah. look, John, binge drinking, all those drugs, opiates, they're there. Okay, um, I want to know how you can possibly uh, become a member of the president's panel on opioid addiction. Is there any chance you can get on that panel? He wants to put a panel together to fight this uh, national crisis. Is there any chance you can get on there? I, I don't know. I would love to be on that panel uh, be, be, because, again, you know, it's like, well, look, when you're, when you're fighting a dragon, you have to cut off the head. You can't cut off the tail. And I've now heard this from President Bush, from President Obama, and now from President Trump. We have to do something about the opioid crisis. I'm tired of lip lips moving and nothing happening are you lobbying the white house yes or no quick no 
But I would like you to. Should be. I should you be. Should be. You Clint bet. Clint Anderson, thank you so much. John, back thank again. you. It's always good to see you. Great to see you too. All right, thanks. Uh, thank Clint you. Anderson, of course, of Payne. 436 Me TV Option 11. If you want to leave a message, see you tomorrow with the Fresno Teachers Association. A strike? I don't know.